Oh, fantastic. Okay. So I'm Carrie Rockman. I'm one of the radiologists in our department and welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, we've had a really great morning this morning, um, working through uh, several topics here at our educational re retreat. And now we have uh, our keynote lecture. So I have the honor of introducing Dr. Andrew C. Wicks. He's uh, been a tremendous help this morning and he's going to teach us some more stuff uh, as we enjoy lunch. So let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Wicks. Uh, he got his BA from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and did his MA and PhD work here at UVA. He is the Ruffin Professor of Business Administration at Darden here at UVA and a director of the Olson Center for Applied Ethics and the director of Darden's doctoral programs. Um, World-renowned teacher, researcher on um, leadership and ethics. Um, so a lot of his courses deal with responsible leadership, servant leadership, and um, contemporary issues in business ethics. Uh, he's the co-author of five books and has served on numerous boards, um, uh, extensive published publications in journals, and guest editors um, and editors of uh, both Business Ethics Quarterly and the Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. Um, not surprising with his amazing pedigree, he's won numerous awards, too many to list, uh, but for his research and his teaching. Um, he's been quoted in a lot of mainstream media as well, um, in uh, such sources as Bloomberg Business Week, um, The Financial Times, Fortune, NPR, uh, Poets and Quants, which I had to look up what that was, Time Magazine and the Washington Post. So it's such an honor for us to be able to work with you today and thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction and it's been a great pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you again for inviting me. I've really enjoyed our work this morning and I'm looking forward to uh, more of it this afternoon. This is also going to be really awkward for me because I like to get up and move around. I'm going to have to be standing still for a little while, so please uh, bear with me. Um, I'm Andy Wicks. I teach at Darden. Uh, believe it or not, I've taught there now. In June, it'll be 22 years. How do I advance? Okay. Um, so, not a lot of people realize my PhD was in religious studies. I went to grad school, not because I wanted to study religion, but because I was interested in asking big questions with my feet on the ground. I didn't care how many angels danced on the head of a pin. I didn't want to study theology or become a priest. I wanted to figure out how some of the questions raised in a, a political philosophy, uh, philosophy and religion, how those questions came out in ways that mattered for how we lived our lives. So that's why I went to grad school. Um, my main focus was actually in medicine, and the religious studies department when I came here was world-renowned in the area of medical ethics. I used to teach medical ethics to undergraduate students. I eventually also got involved in teaching medical students at UVA. Um, I did an internship with a genetics group. I was on the hospital ethics consultation service, and I did one of the craziest, most existentially challenging projects of my entire career working on organ donation for anencephalic infants and trying to change the Natural Death Act of Virginia. I won't go into details, but if you want to hear more about it, I'm happy to talk. It was amazing. But along the way, uh, I found out that there was this guy at the Darden School who'd come just a couple of years ago named Ed Freeman. And my mentor, really encouraging us to get trained uh, broadly, not just in religious studies, said, you should call this guy up and see if he'll teach a class for you. And lo and behold, I did. And Ed Freeman being Ed Freeman said, sure, even though he got nothing for it. It was me and three of my colleagues took an entire semester long class with him. We met three hours every week and it was him and another guy who turns out as these two people are by far the leading lights in the world in business ethics. My first class was with those two. So it left an impression on me. Um, and <clears throat> I, I was applying to jobs in philosophy departments in uh, medical schools and, and I really wanted to get a job there. And Ed said to me, you should apply for a job in a business school. And I looked at him like, what are you talking about? I, I took an economics class as an undergraduate. I knew nothing else about business. He's like, no, trust me, you really should do it. And it turns out there was a job at the University of Washington in Seattle. I applied for it. I went out there and gave my talk and I got the job. I thought I had pulled off the biggest uh, misrepresentation in history and fooled them entirely. And as it turns out, they needed somebody like me and they knew that there weren't programs training them who really knew a lot about business, who also knew a lot about ethics. So I learned a lot 
on the job at the University of Washington. But one of the crazy things was my family and I moved from Charlottesville to Seattle. And I'm just thinking I'm getting away from Charlottesville and medical ethics, and moving to business ethics, moved into my building. And literally that the summer that I transitioned, they had the birth of bioethics conference at the University of Washington in Seattle, because that's where bioethics really in its modern formulation came into being. And then building right next to our building. <laughs> and I decided, well, this is kind of creepy, but I think I'll go ahead and go and listen. And so all the all these amazing people in medical ethics showed up to talk about medical ethics. And even though this was the beginning of the managed care era, they weren't talking at all about business. They weren't all at all talking about the institutions that delivered the care. It was either broad access to care or it was doctor or nurse interactions at the bedside. Those were the questions. Well, what I was dealing with, in, uh, and you'll, you'll hear more about it when I talk about stakeholder theory, business ethics is much more around the institutions and how they function day in and day out, all the kind of questions that are not being talked about there. So the fact that we were skirting business led me in, uh, to write two papers early in my career on the interface between medicine and business. Um, one of the papers, the first one I wrote, was called Ivan Boski or Albert Schweitzer, question mark, why we should reject the dichotomy between medicine and business. And I essentially said, these are caricatures of these two realms that really don't make sense and don't really measure up to how things work in the real world. Arnold Roman had essentially said, business is the enemy of medicine. And I wrote back and I essentially said, A, I think that that's, an, uh, factually, I don't know how you do that, right? Is a hospital medical or is it business? Is a physician in private practice? Are they, I mean, they're making money, but they're also serving patients. Almost everywhere you go, medicine and business are at least partially entangled. So I don't think there's a neat, easy way to segregate the business piece from the medicine piece. But even further, I went on to say, I think even if we could separate the two, I'm not sure that we would be well served to do so. And I lay out in the paper why it actually makes sense to think about these things as more connected, rather than not. Um, and so I was trying to create more of a dialogue or conversation across these areas. I mean, it's not. I must be hitting in the wrong place. Um, so I, I rejected this idea. I see them as linked and uh, how they can help each other in the context of healthcare. Um, and to me, this is a challenge for all of us. How do we create better models of thinking about and enacting medicine that reject this divide? And for me, this is about the need for new stories, new theories and strategies that can link the two and allow us to create excellence in healthcare. And to me, that's the goal. There's some people who say we should just turn medicine into another business and talk about our patients as customers. And to me, if you go that route, while well, I think there's some value in that, it gets kind of scary because we know how some businesses operate. And it's not really having that same sense of care and mission and purpose that I think all people in healthcare really are enamored with, uh, what drew them to that. At the same time, it's acknowledging that we have these challenges around resources, because if we can't pay for that care, we can't pay for the people who provide it, then we can't keep the lights on and, and we are not served as a community. Oh, no, I'm pushing on the wrong side. Okay. Uh, so, as I try to diagnose what's going on, part of, part of this to me is around we have bad models of business. And there's a lot of reasons why we have these models, but I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking this. So, one of the books that I wrote or co-wrote with some colleagues is a book on public trust in business. I've also written some academic articles thinking about the role of trust in business. Where do you think public trust is with respect to business right now? It's not very good. Uh, it's better than Congress. <laughs> it's better than lawyers, but it's not very high. Um, and this is true, especially of multinational corporations and executives. There's a question asked, uh, if I think about a corporate executive, should I be extremely careful and assume that they are likely to do the worst possible thing? Or I can largely think that they have positive intent and I can you know, not have a, a lot of scrutiny over what they're doing. Overwhelmingly, the public says, assume the worst, and we absolutely have to protect ourselves. 
What's fascinating is if I go from an MNC CEO to a mom and pop store business owner, it's the opposite. We actually have a lot of trust in the mom and pop store and the person running that is just not the corporate CEOs. So interesting data there. Uh, I'd also just note some of the background stories of business. And I, I have to be honest, as a kid, I was kind of grown up with this particular view of business, the one that we saw in the movie Wall Street or just thinking about Wall Street. What do we associate with Wall Street? Greed, anything for a buck, right? It's just all about the kill and whoever I have to demolish along the way, that's what business is all about. We also have people like Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff with a lot of people's money, right? And a lot of other people have done similar kinds of things. And one of my favorites that I talk to my students about is this wonderful Disney film called Monsters, Inc. How many people have seen Monsters, Inc.? Awesome. Who is the bad guy in Monsters, Inc.? Does anybody remember? It's the little crabby guy who is so concerned about the family business that he's willing to do anything, potentially even killing a little kid in order to protect the family business. This is not just a story that we are telling about business and who business people are. This is what we are teaching our children about business. And to me, that is deeply disturbing. And one of the things I say to my students is, what's this? How do you feel about that story, if that's our story about business? And what are you going to do to create and tell a different story? Because if that story is true, then in effect, people who are businesses, are people who work in businesses, who are leading businesses, effectively are sociopaths. If I'm willing to do anything to make an extra buck without limits of conscience, then I am a sociopath. And there's actually a documentary a number of years ago that tried to make the case that that's what business people are. In my experience, that doesn't match up to most of the business people that I've interacted with or the students that I have taught. I'm not going to say that there aren't people out, out there that are like that or behave like that, but that is not the core of what business is all about. And to me, it comes back to uh, the guy who's probably most famous for the film Wall Street and a lot of the thinking around business that many people find so problematic. His name's Milton Friedman. Uh, he was a Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago. Um, really, really bright guy. But to me, his ideas and the way in which economics has shaped how we look at the world, especially at business, is really problematic. It's not so much that it's wrong, it's that it is, gives us a very skewed and problematic way to think about business and business people. Um, one of the things that he highlights is, look, what is the motivation for people in business? It's about the money. They say all these other things to try to get you to think that there are other things that they care about. But at the end of the day, why do they do those things? They do them because they help them make more money. So everything comes back to this one motivation. I'm here to tell you, if you think about it, if you step back for just a second and you think about your friends and your partner, if you have one, why are these people your friends and your partner? I'm guessing there's a lot of reasons. They're really nice. They're really good people. But I'm also guessing at some level, part of why they're your friends and your partner is because they add a lot of value in your life. I can bring that economic lens and say, I want to have people that make my life better. And guess what happens when they stop doing that? When they cease creating value and start creating a lot of harm or damage. What do I do? I change my partner, I change my friends. I can bring that same economic lens to understand my personal life. And we would say, when we talk about our personal lives, that narrative can be true at one level, but I can also say, I also care about other people. I'm invested in relationships. I experience love. Those things can coexist. For some reason in business, we say it's only one thing. And that to me does not, from a psychological standpoint, Human beings rarely do something for just one motivation. And we know that there's other ways that these other things can matter at the same time. If we just stop forcing it into it's either this or that, it becomes easier to see them as interconnected. The other thing that Milton Friedman says um, is that shareholders own the company. It's their money that makes the company exist. As it turns out, um, Lynn Stout, who is a brilliant uh, lawyer and uh, professor in law school, wrote a great book called The Shareholder Value Myth. And in it, she highlights that that is one of the biggest fictions of all time. Shareholders do not own the corporation. Shareholders own the piece of paper. 
They own a share in a company. It is a contractual obligation, just like other kinds of contracts that corporations engage with with other stakeholders like suppliers. They, they absolutely provide the money and you need to listen to them, but it is a, con a conceptual and legal mistake to say that shareholders own the company. His entire theory is based on this idea that it's only shareholders that have a claim on the firm because they own the firm. That's, that's simply not true. Um, the other thing that Friedman highlights, and this is the thing that he's uh, famous for, he tries to make the case that businesses and management specifically, my students that I teach, this is the mantra, maximize profits for shareholders. Does that make you get a warm and fuzzy right now? Yeah, it doesn't feel so great. Um, but there's also a lot of ambiguity around this. He tries to make the case, he's actually trying to make a moral argument to them. He's trying to make them feel bad if they do something other than this goal. Um, but even understanding what that would mean is really complicated. Like, how do I know if I maximized? If I made a penny last uh, last quarter on our earnings, I made money for my shareholders, but did I maximize profits? Is that about share price? Is that about how we compare to our competitors? There's a whole bunch of things I could potentially fit into there that really aren't articulated. The other thing too that comes up that's really important is about time horizon. If I ask my students to maximize profits for the company today or this week, what set of decisions would they make? I'm guessing they would be pretty radical. <laughs> they do what they would not invest in a lot of things that would create longer term value. And they would be really focused on how do I get the most money out of now? And that leads to a crazy set of decisions. But if it's the quarter or the year or even two years, there's an entirely different set of decisions that I might make. And if it's five and 10 years out, I'm much more likely to bring in a longer term perspective. So what is this asking me to do? Is it self unclear? And depending on how I change the parameters, I might get very different behavior. Um, so Ed Freeman wrote this book and I'll, I've got a couple of uh, resources at the, on the last slide. Um, I'll talk more about this book from 1984. He's the guy that everybody says invented stakeholder theory. And there's a reason for it. He wrote a book in 1984 called St Strategic Management, a Stakeholder Approach. It is the first book out there that really kind of systematically develops it. And he goes out of his way to say, I didn't invent stakeholder theory because there were a bunch of, uh, almost with any other idea, there's a bunch of other kind of germs that are out there that you, uh, uh, dots that he connected. Um, so he gives a lot of credit to many other groups and individuals that helped him come up with this idea. But he said, it's a really simple idea. The, the idea that firms exist to create values for value for stakeholders. Now, when he, when I, say stakeholders, how do I know a stakeholder when I see one? There's two different definitions or ways to think about this. Uh, one is a primary definition and one is a secondary definition. To be a primary stakeholder, I have to be part of what makes the firm a going concern. The firm cannot operate without me. That's true of employees, that's true of suppliers, that's true of customers, that's true of the local community, that's true of people that provide the money. Take away any of them and you don't have an organization. Okay, groups that are part of that value chain are primary stakeholders. But there's also this definition of secondary stakeholders. Secondary stakeholders are anyone who can be affected by or who affects the corporation. If I give you that definition, who's a stakeholder? The flipping planet, right? And that's just way more than I can possibly serve, right? I can't do that. I think about secondary because secondary stakeholders may impact me and I need to be paying attention to them. But that does not say I have a positive obligation to make them better off. Just one example, if I'm Exxon Mobil, would you say I have an obligation to think about and advance the interest of Rainforest Action Network? Rainforest Action Network is a nonprofit whose very existence is essentially trying to run Exxon Mobil and all the fossil fuel companies completely out of business. Does ExxonMobil have an obligation? Ed would say no. Secondary stakeholders are ones that you need to pay attention to and need uh, you need to think about their interests, but you don't have a positive duty to look out for and advance their interests. There's a shift in purpose. Instead of just maximizing profits, the focus here is on creating maximizing value for your primary stakeholders. Along with that, 
And that seems kind of complicated because I got all these groups and sometimes their interests do not align. Especially if I think about it in terms of the money, if I give a dollar to my shareholders, then in theory, I'm, I'm taking that dollar away from all of my other stakeholders. So it may seem as though their interests are conflicting. But he's arguing that even though organizations have to make difficult decisions, sometimes we have to close plants, sometimes we have to stop making certain products, sometimes we have to fire people. I don't want to have systematic trade-offs across my stakeholder groups. Sometimes I've got to fire people or close plants. Sometimes I have to stop making products. But I don't ever get to saying I'm consistently going to lift up this stakeholder group and consistently shove down this one. Because if I lose the support of any one of those key stakeholder groups, my ability to be successful is compromised. And he's saying you, you might have to have a trade-off in one instance, but you don't do that systematically. Otherwise, you lose the support of that key stakeholder group. How do you end up accomplishing this? It's it through balance and voice, as well as wise leadership. Just like running a family, it's complicated to figure out how I manage all these same relationships at the same time. But the, the magic is, if I can create that, I can have incredible synergies across these groups. And by the way, the rationale for why should uh, firms manage for stakeholders. Well, if I go back to Milton Friedman's argument, it's not just about property rights. It's about other kinds of investment. If you are an employee of an organization, have you made an investment? Think about how challenging it is to just pick up your life to potentially give away your salary and all your benefits to take the risk of finding a job someplace else. Employees make investments. Local communities make investments. All these other groups make investments that are at least analogous to what shareholders do. And as a result, Ed says, they deserve consideration. Management should be thinking about their interest along with the other interests of other primary stakeholder groups all at the same time. And this also highlights that stake stakeholders want value. They don't just want more money and stuff. Absolutely, every stakeholder, if you asked them, they'd say, would you like a little bit more money and a little bit more stuff? They'd say yes, but that's not all they want. They also care about the way in which you show up and do your business. They care about things like fairness. You know, I'm getting a pretty good salary, but I'm also paying attention to what my peers are getting. If you're not being treating me fairly, both in terms of the amount of funds that I get, but the way that I'm treated in the organization, I'm going to pay attention to that and say, maybe I don't want to work here anymore. Maybe I don't want to work for your competitor or somebody else. And I, I also just highlight this Whole Foods example. And I, again, I'm, I'm guilty of this because I'm somebody who goes to Whole Foods. But when you see that person walking around with a Whole Foods bag on their shoulder, are they just using that as this utilitarian thing to carry stuff? Or are they sending a message to you about who they are? If you think about the brands that you love and the brands that you continue to go back to, we feel some identity, identification, some connection to this. And we ought not to miss that. I think that's actually really interesting and really important. Um, I, I teach a second year class for our MBA students and our executive students that has been sort of a joy for of my life to teach. And it's called Ultimate Questions in Creating Value for Stakeholders. One of the things I try to teach them from day one is corporations care about ultimate questions like, who are we? Why are we here? What does it mean to live a good life? How should we get along with others? I tell my students on day one, everyone in this room has answers to those questions, even if you haven't sat down to think about them. If I gave you four sentences to answer each of those questions, what would you say? And if you don't feel so great about your answers, what else would you want to experience, learn, and do that helps you feel like you had better answers to those questions? And oh, by the way, how much time have you spent talking to people who answer those questions differently than you? And the answer almost uniformly is, Zero. The premise of the class I teach is to say, we need to think about these questions and how they apply to us. And I'm gonna make you have conversations in groups with people who think about them differently than you. What they also come to see is corporations have answers to uh, two ultimate questions. If you think about marketing and brand, they don't wanna sell you a widget at arm's length. They wanna imbue their brand their experience with meaning that makes you want to come back and buy again and again and again. So to some extent, I'm really doing this work in order to get people to want to give me the money. 
On the one hand, that's kind of scary because we don't look to we don't want to look to corporations to define our sense of purpose and meaning in the world. At the same time, if we're really honest with ourselves, a lot of us are getting some elements of our identity through that. And oh, by the way, how many people in here have logos on their clothing, on their hats, on their other things? You are essentially representing a brand for free. You are sharing their message, their ideology. Fascinating to think about. We don't see it, we don't pay attention to it, but it's there. And how do we harness that potential? Okay, uh, stakeholder theory to me gives us better models of business. Um, in part because it rethinks profits and people. We tend to think about these as opposing forces that have nothing to do with each other. Um, and one of the questions I ask, I, I have a session with our MBA for executive students um, when they first start the program, we have a leadership week in Charlottesville and they're learning all some of the basics. And I have them read Ed Freeman article and I have them read Milton Friedman's article. And I ask my students what this all means. They say, how many of your organizations tell you that our people are our most important asset? And like 70% of the hands shoot up in the air. And they say, how many of you believe it? How many of you experience that as an actual true statement versus a slogan? and about 70% of the hands go down. And I say, isn't that interesting? For me, the challenge is, if I'm gonna say something, I better do something. And if I'm gonna make a claim, I should at least talk to that stakeholder to understand what does that mean to them? What do you really want? And if I cannot provide that, I've actually done harm by making that statement because I've shown you that I'm not credible. I've shown you that I'm going to essentially be slog sloganistic and jingoistic instead of actually following through on my word. If you don't mean it, don't say it. If you're not listening to your stakeholders, you don't know what you can say credibly. Um, and this is really highlighting uh, that dimension that's super important. And this highlights the idea that uh, people and profits are not opposed or either or they're connected and aligned in great organizations. We understand how we're creating value for stakeholders and we actually follow through and listen to our stakeholders because they're telling us we're doing it. It's also a chance to revisit Adam Smith. What was Adam Smith's greatest book? I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. The one that he's most famous for is The Wealth of Nations and that is not his best book, according to him. TMS, anybody read Theory of Moral Sentiments from Adam Smith? He thought of it as his, his best book. And what was true of economics for the most part before the start of the 1800s was most of the great economists were also moral philosophers and most of the moral, great moral philosophers also knew something about economics. Then something happened when uh, economics decided to become the physics of the social sciences and essentially forget what's a human being making some highly simplifying assumptions so they can bring mathematics and create these law-like generalizations, they essentially forgot what a human is. And to me, this is deeply problematic. Smith also had this view that self-interest absolutely was important, but self-interest for him was a moral ideal. It is actually good that people think about their self-interest because if they do, we don't have to have society spending all their time taking care of other people because they don't know how to take care of themselves. And while they have to, they ought to think about their own interest, they have to respect the interests of others. Why is it in business that I get paid? Why would somebody hand over to me their hard earned cash? It's because I have created something that they value. And not only did they value, but they value enough to hand me over that money. For Smith, it is both and. Yes, I'm thinking about my interest and what I can do to give, get someone to want to give me that money, but I only can get to there if I'm actually looking out for their interests. This says I shouldn't be thinking about how can I scam a customer? It's how can I make the customer whole and deliver what they really want? Um, so it's a both end rather than either or. I have a colleague who is one of the leaders in the world on entrepreneurship. Her name is Sarah Sarasvathy. She created this idea called effectuation, which I highly recommend you look at if you're interested at all in that. Um, I was on faculty with her at University of Washington, and she's also my colleague here at Darden. And on her, for her dissertation, she had conversations with entrepreneurs. She sat down with them and asked them to tell, tell her their story. Now, many people were expecting, it's just how much, you know, I want to make, I'm going to make a ridiculous pile of money, so I'll never have to worry about anything else for the rest of my life. That's what they thought that she was, they were going to say. To a person, all of these entrepreneurs said, 
the reason they did their, they created their widget or their process, they wanted to change the world. They wanted to make people's lives better. And to me, that re reinforces this idea that I can care about helping people and I can also care about doing well at the same time. And oh, by the way, if they really just wanted the money, they wouldn't have started an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial venture. That is a really lousy percentage return versus working for an established company. And what this suggests, what Freeman talks about is avoiding the separation thesis. It says that uh, separation thesis says there's business over here, there's ethics over here, they have nothing to do with each other, and people trying to bring them together are essentially, it's a lost cause because once you've defined them as independent, there's no way really to bring them back together again. Ethics is an extra, it's baked into our account of business and medicine, and even Friedman's view is based on values. While Friedman talks in the language of economics, if you go back to his article and you read it carefully, the foundation of it is about moral arguments, about the importance of individual freedom, about the right to be left alone by government, about the, the ability to do things with your own property for yourself and with other people to create new value. That's actually a very rich, interesting moral story. So it's not business versus ethics, it's holding these two things together. So for me, the better, a better way forward is avoid seeing that money is bad or evil, uh, that money isn't the only thing or the purpose. Um, and to me, if you go back to stakeholder theory, again, it's not just your shareholders that want money. Employees want a good wage and they want secure jobs. The only way you can give them that is if you care about the money. Customers want to pay less for your products and they want them to be better products. They wanna be able to continue to get them. The only way you can deliver on that promise is if you care about the money. All these groups care about the money and they care about these other things. Um, so money's important, but it's not the only thing or the purpose of organizations. Organizations need a strong purpose. And again, if I go back to Smith and entrepreneurs, the money comes from, if I do this thing and I do it well, my customers are gonna come and buy from me. If I do this thing, uh, and do it well, people are going to want to work for us, buy from us, and want us around in their communities. That's how you create sustainable long-term organizations. And fundamentally, this suggests we, got, we have to get past the medicine business divide, find ways to connect how we talk about mission and values with concerns about efficiency and resources, because that's not going away. <laughs> and how can we do it in a more intelligent way? From my experience, and from what I've heard from many of my friends in the healthcare industry, it's a shouting match. It's either the business people telling you the constraints that are going to be put on you because of concerns about cost, or it's the medical people saying, this is about patients and patient well-being. In my mind, both groups ought to be talking about both things at the same time. The last thing, uh, just in terms of resources on stakeholder theory, while there's a this field has exploded. If you look at the literature on stakeholder theory, uh, it's massive now. Um, and as a matter of fact, this 2010 book, uh, Stakeholder Theory, the State of the Art, was really just trying to map out all the influences of places where stakeholder theory has gone. And it's, it's immense. And that was 2010, it's gone even crazier now. Um, it started in ethics and management. It's diffused into these other areas, including healthcare, law, public policy, not-for-profits. Uh, the two books that I would most recommend if you're interested in this idea is Ed's 84 book and the book that we wrote together in 2010. The other thing I'd highlight that's really, I think it's cool, the Olson Center that I direct and I run with my colleagues, we actually created a documentary film. And the documentary film was about the purpose of business and how we think about that today. Um, this happened um, just before the business roundtable changed their view. The business roundtable, which is this lobbying group for corporate uh, executives, used to say the purpose of business, according to us, is to maximize profits for shareholders. In 2020 or 2021, they changed the definition and they now say it's to create value for stakeholders. So Ed's idea has actually had that level of, of impact. But this film uh, highlights the evolution of this thinking and involves talking to economists like Robert Reich, uh, Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, and a bunch of other books on management, a lot of leading lights on both sides of the, uh, the conversation. The last thing I'd mentioned that is, to me, super cool. Uh, anybody here know the name Michael Jensen of Jensen and Meckling? Jensen and Meckling 
our brilliant finance professors who created the theoretical ideas that supported Milton Friedman's argument. That's what gave it academic credence. In this film, he acknowledges that that theory was wrong. And instead of maximized profits for shareholders, it's maximized firm value. And if I'm focusing on firm value, that's not incompatible with thinking about core stakeholders. And he's now become a very public proponent of stakeholder theory and against shareholder theory. With that, I'm gonna be quiet and take any questions you've got. Once again, a thank you for offering all this kind of Yeah. 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 Sure. And again, to me, thinking about a Wall Street firm versus thinking about a, a hospital in a community are very different things in terms of their priorities. What I would say is both those organizations have to think about what are sustainable ways for us to provide the services or the goods that we provide. Because I can throw all the resources at solving problems, especially on things where there's no return or there's a minimal return. And if I do that consistently over time, what's going to happen to me? I, I'm going to go out of, out of business. I, I will no longer exist. So even though, again, I would say profits don't drive that conversation, I've got to be paying attention to that as I, again, and to me, the interesting thing is what is my mission? I don't think about my mission in the absence of understanding what that means in the real world and how I have to operate. But whether I'm a not-for-profit or a for-profit, I got to be clear about what's that value add that we provide and how can I do that in a way that is sustainable, that allows us to continue to have resources such that we can do this over time. Because the minute we go out of business and stop being able to do what we're doing, we're hurting them even worse than not providing some of those services. Yeah. <laughs> it's very small. It's very small. Yeah. Yeah. So that means either getting too busy. Yeah. So that plus plus has to be able to have our wall. Yeah. So I get I guess like that's just like our thought process. Like sure. Now we're stuck. We're not going to be able to get back into the seat. Yep. Talk to the system. Other than engage. Yeah. But if you look for something that's great. Yeah. So it's like almost like I'm being broke up. Well, again, ever since managed care became a thing, but even before managed care, there were, this still this conversation still happened. In the context of managed care, became much more front and center. And ever since then, uh, again, a lot of places have just allowed MBAs to come in and call the shots. And for many people, especially who came to healthcare because they cared about mission, they felt like mission got lost. And it's just, you know, what are those the best returns on individual services? Um, what are the things we need to do to, to make more money and have fewer surgeries or processes that don't understand anything? That to me is 
is a mistake. And I, I also regret the influence of that kind of thinking if it doesn't bring this kind of nuance to how I think about that. At the same time, in the paper that I wrote about Albert Schweitzer, Albert Schweitzer versus Ivan Bosky, I note, if you think about doctors, people who go through medical school and nursing school, did they not care about having a good return? If I think about where there is overcapacity and undercapacity, is the overcapacity and the specialized services that I get a higher return? For the most part, that's true. Doctors rightfully want to get paid well, and I don't, I don't begrudge them at all. And it's also not incompatible to say they are, they are also passionate about medicine. I need to think about a system where both of those things can be true. What I'm trying to suggest back is that can also be true of business people. And I would tell you that many of the students that I interact with are people who care deeply about helping make the world a better place, about serving other people. Because businesses, again, why do you give them the money? Because they're doing something that makes your life better off. The more we can hold on to that idea, the easier it becomes to have those conversations. What I was ending with is saying, we got to get out of it's either or. Either I care about the mission and helping people, or I just care about the money. And if you're encountering people that the only thing that they know how to talk about is how to make more money, then you know that what they're bringing to the organization is not helpful. Yeah. Great. All right. So shift in the, in the view of the world between the stakeholder and the shareholder approach. Yeah. And I'm wondering how far into the general business community has the stakeholder view penetrated? And I'm specifically asking the question because in our own medical world, we interact with insurance companies, yeah. which seem to operate very much under a shareholder approach. It's difficult. Again, I mean, it, it's it's a messy, complicated question to try to answer because there's so many different kinds of organizations and ways of thinking. To me, it's changed a lot. When I first came to Darden, um, and I teach a class of 70 students in the first year, I teach introduction to business ethics. We'd read these articles, and I, I was reminded just how skewed the room was. The first year I taught at Darden, I ended up bringing her back as a guest speaker in an elective I taught maybe 10 years after she'd been there, 15 years after she'd been there. And she remembered that conversation. At the end of the conversation, they read Ed, they read Milton, I have the students vote. Which of these two views most aligns with how you think business should run? That first year, I had 69 students who voted for Milton and one who voted for Ed. 69 to one. Fast forward 22 years, what's that ratio now? It's about 80 to 20 for Ed versus Milton. And if you go worldwide, the language and the way of thinking about business has changed really dramatically. Um, I would also just share, we've done research about this. So I've written a number of articles and books talking about the ideas, Ed's ideas versus Milton's ideas. And to me, that conversation is interesting, but it's just people talking about ideas. I'm, I became interested in how does this affect people behaviorally? If I walk out of that room having read Ed and Milton, and I have my own idea about what, is, what does it mean to run a good organization, how do I treat my stakeholders, what am I trying to accomplish? Regardless of what view they come out with, they have a view. How does that matter? And my colleagues and I have shown that there are behavioral effects. If I go out of the world thinking that my job is to maximize profits for shareholders, I have one set of behaviors. If I walk out and I think about it from the standpoint of creating value for stakeholders, I actually act, talk, and behave differently. And what's fascinating is in terms of things like um, self-determination. So at your job, do you have autonomy, competence, and relatedness? There's a ton of research that shows the more autonomy, the more ability to connect with other people in your organization, the more you know how to do your job, the better it is for you as an individual worker it's also true that it helps the organization. In the set of experiments that we ran, just by shifting the word from stakeholder to shareholder in terms of the emphasis, the people that ran through that experiment reported higher levels of self-determination just based on the narrative. So if you want to connect with people and make them feel motivated, getting into that limbic brain, stakeholder theory is actually a more effective mechanism. Shareholder theory does not. 
Um, we've also shown this with the same thing with job satisfaction and perspective taking. Do you actually take the time to look at the world through the eyes of a given stakeholder versus just, hey, I know what my employees want or I know what my customers want. If you start with a stakeholder lens, you have higher levels of job satisfaction and you have more likely investment in, in um, perspective taking. The work that we're doing right now is around um, essentially moral harm. I, I believe that the shareholder narrative makes it easy for us to do mental gymnastics such that as a shareholder person, I never feel like I do anything wrong, right? I am just, if I'm firing you or closing a plant, I'm just helping you get your next job. I haven't done anything wrong to you. As a matter of fact, I'm actually helping you because that job was never sustainable and now I'm helping you to get to the next thing. I think that that's scary. And as a matter of fact, it enables a lot of justifications that an average human would never get to. Whereas I think if you start with a stakeholder narrative, you may say we have to sometimes close a plant or fire a person because of the good of the collective organization, but I should feel bad about that, right? I have harmed a stakeholder whose my job is to actually benefit. I, I can still say we need to do that, but I will then go and approach that stakeholder and say, wow, that was hard for me. I feel bad and I wish we could have done it a different way, but we still had to do it. To me, those are two very different worlds. And I really want to understand what's driving and motivating behavior because I want to see less of this corporate brutality on the world. I want to see more compassion coming out of what business is about. Can, can you speak to, um, I, I guess, uh, differences uh, between states and, and Europe in, in this regard? Because, you know, in our area, uh, the, our big vendors, Philips, uh, yeah. GE, Siemens, you know, the, the Phillips and Siemens have had uh, worker representation on their boards for yep. a long time. You know, clearly long-term viability of the company is a primary um, uh, aim, which seems to be a lot more aligned with stakeholder, whereas the history of GE has <laughs> all been about, you know, short-term profitability and, uh, and, and, and quarterly earnings. So I, yeah. I, I don't know that that was true back in the fifties and, mm -hmm. and before, but it's certainly been true of the Jack Welch era and beyond. And, and, and it's also true of a lot of other corporations, but your point is uh, what's the difference between America and Europe in yeah, terms of with, this yeah, thing? In terms of embrace of stakeholder theory. I mean, is that true? Yeah. Are they in a different? I mean, when I, when I teach this stuff in Europe, it's like 99 to one that they all line up behind Ed. And this is just kind of how they think about business. But it's also tricky because I would argue that you still see some European companies acting more from a Milton mindset. Mm -hmm. And this is the real difficulty. Like, you know, one of the things you might think about is Andy says there's shareholder and stakeholder. And so either I'm a shareholder or a stakeholder manager and a shareholder and stakeholder firm. I think it's more complicated than that. Sometimes I might think shareholder ideas and speak that way, but I'm actually in terms of my behavior, I'm really doing a lot of things that Ed would ask me to do. Um, I, I might think I'm a real stakeholder person, but I, I have a lot of these ways of talking and behaving that look a lot like Milton. To me, it's got to be a blend of the two. You got to listen to the words, but as important, if not more important, look at what they actually do. But certainly from a rhetorical standpoint, Europe is much more in the shareholder camp. But I also think that the U.S. it's happening and that business roundtable statement is one thing. But like I'm also saying about that, just because they say those words doesn't mean that they're doing those deeds and we ought to be paying attention to that. The other thing, by the way, that Europe does that's really, really interesting is to me, one of the biggest challenges facing the world going forward. And that is we know how to measure shareholder returns. We're really good at that. What we're not so good at is capturing the actual footprint of organizations in the world. What's the effect on the climate? What's the effect on local communities? What's the effect on employees? Because while they may have really good paying jobs, maybe they're becoming de-skilled. Maybe they're becoming depressed and having significant psychological harm. I need to find metrics and ways of tracking that more complex notion of firm performance. Because I might be kicking butt when it comes to shareholder returns, but the way in which I'm going about that is actually causing a lot of harm to a lot of other groups. We ought to have tools that help us capture and measure that. And to me, that's one of the most important conversations happening today. Europe is ahead of the, the curve. I actually worked for an or, or I, I was a advisor to an organization called Visio. They've now been bought by Moody's. But this was what they did is they tried to go out and measure corporations and give reports that helped shine lights on all these other more complex aspects of what corporations do.
time. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you to everyone who online. Um, we're going to close the meeting now and thank you for being here. Thank you.